So my research was born out of my experience as a, as a teacher. I used to teach EAL children in a, in a big international school in Bangkok. And one of the things that we were told a lot about when, we were, uh, when I was working there, when I was teaching there, was to use the first language as a tool for, uh, for enhancing curriculum understanding and to, to help learn English as well. Um, but this was always quite vague in terms of what we were told to do. You know, how do you use the first language? Occasionally you'd get some, uh, some pointers. They would say things like have a bilingual teaching assistant read through the contents of a book before then, um, sorry, read through the contents of a book in the first language before then um, looking at that book in English. And so that the idea being that they would have activated their prior knowledge, they would have understanding which was developed out of their first language, which could then be applied in the classroom. Now, when I returned to the UK as a teacher, I was faced with the rather difficult problem of having, what, 14, 20, 25 different languages represented in the school. So how does one operationalize this, this ideal of being able to preview material in the first language before then meeting it in English so that, um, that you know, with the idea that this will help children to understand it? Uh, so I, I thought that this was uh, worthy of investigation. Um, I did, first of all, a systematic review where I looked at to see whether there was any, um, any studies that had already been done which looked at um, th this, this idea of, of a, a kind of a standalone uh, use of the first language with second language learners um, as a kind of a, a, an intervention or a, a, a small, um, uh, what I've described as an ad hoc um, uh, intervention to use with these children. And there wasn't very much. I, I did the systematic review. I looked at studies that had been done since um, 1980 when Jim Cummins uh, first proposed the hypothesis of uh, linguistic interdependence, which means that, that one language is, is helpful to learning another language. Uh, the stronger you are in your first language, the more likely you are to get strong in your second language. Um, uh, so I looked for a whole load of studies, that, um, as many studies as I could find, that had addressed this particular issue and uh, didn't find many, but found some uh, which looked quite promising that revolved about vocabulary teaching. Um, one of those studies was done uh, in Korea, where primary school children were um, taught either by native speakers of English who weren't very proficient or at all proficient in Korean, or bilingual Korean um, English teachers. And in one group, they, um, they were given, uh, the, uh, given definitions of new and tricky vocabulary in English only, and in the other group they were giving it, given it in, in Korean. And after the study they found that the children's ability to uh, remember and to produce those, those vocabulary items was better in the group that had the Korean explanation of the word rather than the English only explanation definition. So I used that as a basis for the intervention study that I did. Um, this was uh, conducted in British primary schools, four British primary schools, using a randomized crossover design. So I uh, had a group of 47 children and they were randomly allocated either to a group that would receive instruction in their home language and then cross over to instruction in their, in their second language, in English, um, or a group where you started in English and then moved over into, into um, first language only. Um, sorry, a combination of first language and second language. I developed a series of videos that explained the vocabulary items that I was interested in. So you have the, so the, 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 um, the intervention is vocabulary teaching. The comparison is between using the first language as a way to mediate understanding of the new vocabulary items um, compared to um, use of only English to mediate the understanding of those vocabulary items. Um, faced with the problem of lots of different languages, how do you do that? I have some proficiency in, in English and Thai and schoolboy French, um, but I don't have the proficiency in the 14, 15, 20, however many languages that were represented in the, in the schools that I worked with. Um, so I had to find a way around that. In order to do that, I wrote what I describe as uh, expanded definitions of the vocabulary items. So rather than just a straightforward dictionary definition, it was a bit more than that. It was using Dorothy Freyer's um, idea of, of, of um, content understanding that you have to know what something is, what something isn't, examples of those things, and, uh, and be able to write your own definition. So I based these, um, these, these expanded explanations around that principle. So I wrote scripts which said, this is the word you're learning. So for example, reptile was one of them. These are words taken from the British National Curriculum that children would be expected to know in order to do well um, at the end of primary school and by the time they get to the end of primary school. And I took, uh, so I described what a reptile was. You know, it's got scales, it's cold-blooded, lays eggs. 
Um, and then I, just, then I gave some examples, so a snake, a, a, a lizard. I uh, gave some non-examples and explained why. So uh, ducks, for example, they lay eggs, but they're not reptiles because they have feathers, not scales. And then I gave a sort of a, 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 what I feel was a child-friendly uh, definition of that word. Um, and then I had those translated into the 14 different languages represented among the students in my, in my study. And that was, there were all sorts of different languages from all parts of the world. So we had um, European languages like German, Polish, French, um, Asian languages like Urdu, Punjabi, um, Mandarin Chinese, Korean, uh, Malayalam, and, and uh, you know, real range. Like this. And uh, there was Arabic and, uh, and all sorts of different languages represented amongst this sample. Um, and so they were, so the, I had the, the scripts, the English scripts translated into all these different languages. And then I found people who were willing to record them. So native speakers of those languages that recorded them orally. Um, I then put the, or, the audio soundtrack on top of a series of images which illustrated the concept of the word that was being learned. So that's, there, that's where my, uh, that, that's the, the materials for the, um, for the study. I then, like I said, I've, I've allocated these children into these two um, conditions. They sat down in the classroom um, with a laptop or an iPad, a pair of headphones. They listened to the um, definition. And then we filled out what's called a Freya diagram, which is, which is what the, the, the idea of the Dorothy Freya's uh, concept mastery um, idea, where they, they took notes. Um, if they were in the first language condition, they were free to take the notes in whatever language they wanted, English or their home language. If they were in the English-only condition, they were asked to um, just complete the, the, um, the graphic organizer in English. Um, although we know that with, with bilingual and multilingual people, you can't ever turn off the first language. It's always in there going around. So they may well have used their first language regardless of what group they're in. But the, the difference between the, the two conditions, as far as I was concerned, was that they were given direct instruction in either in only English or in the first language. And, and that was what was being compared, the effects of those two different things. Um, at the end of each phase, so this is, remember, this is a randomized crossover study. So they start off in one condition. Then they're assessed on the words that they learnt during that period, and then they start the new condition, which is so it, for one group they started off with these videos only in their first language, and then they crossed over to English videos, and the other group started with English only videos, and then crossed over to their first language videos. Um, it was probably worth just saying here that a randomized crossover design is not always applicable, it's not always suitable for depending on what you're trying to teach. So um, if you're teaching, uh, you're comparing two different ways of teaching, I don't know, phonics, for example, you can assume that there's some way, that there's some building of knowledge, that, that the first lesson leads to the second lesson, which leads to the third lesson, so you get this cumulative knowledge, um, which wouldn't really lend itself to crossover so well, because they've already established some knowledge in the first condition. Um, in my uh, in my experiment, the, the, the knowledge was rather independent. So you didn't have to have learnt one thing in order to then learn the next thing. So you didn't have to, one didn't have to worry about there being this sort of effect of having done it um, already and then doing it again. These were independent uh, vocabulary items that you didn't have to understand one in order to understand the other, uh, which allowed me then not to need a washout period between phases and, and so on and so forth. So I was, um, uh, this is the, we got to the end of the first part, the first phase, they were assessed on the, uh, on the words that they had learnt during that phase or that they had been taught, whether they learnt them or not was another thing. Um, and they were, they were assessed on their receptive knowledge and their productive knowledge. Um, the productive was done first, so they were given a closed um, procedure or a gap fill, so there's a sentence, um, and it would be something like, a blank is a kind of animal that has scales and lays eggs and is cold-blooded. We call this kind of animal a something like that, and they would fill in the gaps, so they would produce reptile if they remembered it. And the receptive knowledge was a, a multiple choice. They were given four pictures and a word, So, uh, and they were asked to identify the picture that was a reptile, and they would choose A, B, C, or D. Um, then we crossed over and they did the same thing again. Two weeks of intervention. They're learning nine words over the, over the course of two weeks in both phases. And then at the end, they were assessed again um, for their productive and receptive knowledge of those vocabulary items. Um, I also did a delayed post-test on the first set of words. 
my study happened right at the very end of the school year so unfortunately I wasn't able to go and do a, um, a delayed post test for those children um, who were in the study because they were all on holiday or they'd moved on to different schools and find it because they, some of them were in year six so finding them was very very complicated so we've got a delayed post test just on the first part which adds some information to, to what we can understand from uh, this intervention um, so there's the study it's got two phases. They've done some work in first language. They've done some work in second language. We're comparing and seeing whether that has an, imp uh, an impact on how well they remembered those words, both for receptive and productive uh, understanding or knowledge of those words. Uh, what I found, uh, based on this study, was that there wasn't any statistically significant difference between the averages for both groups. And that is to say both groups learnt the words equally well, essentially. Um, some children made a bigger gain than others from baseline to uh, to the to the endpoint assessment, but um, that didn't. But there wasn't a difference between the conditions, so they made an equally good gain, um, of whether they were presented the definitions in English or whether they were presented the definitions in in their home language. So what does this mean? Well, as a teacher, it's quite useful information because um, if this is reflective of, of, of a, of a ge more general trend, I was working with only 47 children, remember, there's, you know, it's, it could be done in a, a much bigger um, study would give us more information. But at least on the face of it, it tells me as a teacher, I don't have to um, worry about trying to find all of these definitions in all of these different languages for all of the languages that are represented in my class. I, um, I, can, I can be uh, confident that if I give that kind of explanation, that quite detailed explanation of a new vocabulary word, um, if I do it in English and I allow the children to, to use a FRAG diagram to record their notes and their understanding of it, that they will um, uh, do as well as they might in, if they were given the, in, um, the instruction in their first language. Um, but it doesn't stop there because, of course, my sample was represented, it was representative of a whole load of different levels of English um, proficiency um, and of first language proficiency. So well, some children were highly proficient in English um, and less proficient in their first language. Uh, some children were highly proficient in their first language but less proficient in English and then everything in between. So what I would like to do next is to try and uh, to, to uh, isolate some of these uh, these demographic groups within the sample that I had and then try and work out whether this has an effect, which is whether there's an effect for um, a differential effect between children who are highly proficient in one or other of those languages or both, and those who are less proficient in one or other of those languages or both. So, um, for example, uh, newly arrived children in the UK who have strong first language, um, who are new to English, maybe there will be a difference between them and children who are um, fluent in English uh, or highly proficient in English and highly proficient in their first languages. Um, maybe by the time they get there, the, the, the use of the first language has different purpose rather than a, a, the purpose that I was looking at. Uh, so that's for the future. Um, but for the moment, this, is, this has been a really interesting um, investigation into this widely held belief that, um, uh, that the first language can be used in, in classrooms to improve academic outcomes and linguistic outcomes for children. Um, I'm not saying that it's not the case, but, I'm, but what I am saying is that based on the very small amount of uh, research that I found in my systematic review, plus the findings of my own study, we're still in a, in a, a situation of equipoise. We don't really know um, how to operationalise this, this um, thoughtful theory about first language use in second language learning. Mm -hmm.